Hi everyone, my name is James. Uh, many of you already know me from my woodworking channel, Kings Fine Woodworking, but some of you are here for the first time, and I just, in case you don't know me, I have an extensive science background in chemistry, physics, and biology, and I used to teach chemistry, in fact, organic chemistry, for quite some time. So I'm putting together a new series, uh, basically just for YouTube, all about science, uh, different things about nature, how things happen, why they happen, and hopefully you find it interesting. If you do, or if you like this video, please consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you. So I have this ultraviolet germicidal irradiation box that I built in my wood shop. And I have actually a link down below in the description to my woodworking channel. And I'll show you if you're interested exactly how to build this start to finish. I'm including free plans with it in the event that anybody wants one or needs one, maybe to give to a local hospital in the event that these might be needed should the situation get worse for masks. And it's got a parabolic reflective mirror on the inside to perfectly balance the light that comes up from the upper and lower half of the box in order to sanitize anything on the grid. You can see when the light comes on without having to open the box. It's got a safety switch uh, that will disable the power of the light with the thing should open spontaneously if somebody opens it before the power cycle is done. And the operation is really very straightforward once the box is complete. Uh, you just load the masks into the box or anything else that you want to sanitize that will fit in there. Light comes equally from the top and the bottom so you get equal coverage. Just close the box down, make sure the power is turned on, and then set the timer, and it's good to go. As everyone already knows, we are still in the middle of a pandemic. The need for quality medical masks like the N95 respirator is still with us. Of course, in some places, the supply has improved, but unfortunately, the supply might not be adequate everywhere. And now that we're moving into the fall, Healthcare providers will have an even greater demand for personal protective equipment. The fall will bring with it the flu season, and all by itself, it is taxing to hospitals. But in the presence of an existing pandemic, the situation could be far worse. I developed this ultraviolet C sanitizing box to clean used masks should an emergency arise where there is a mask shortage. It isn't safe for doctors and nurses working on the front lines to reuse the same mask for days at a time. The chances of the mask becoming a vector to spread illness is too great. I should point out that outside of an emergency situation, like a pandemic, where there is a mask shortage, the CDC does not allow the reuse or decontamination of masks. We are currently fighting the SARS-CoV-2. It belongs to the beta coronavirus category. It has a roundish shape, but it is pleomorphic, which means its size and shape can vary. It has a diameter of approximately 125 nanometers. Uh, this is the virus that leads to the disease known as COVID-19. COVID is an acronym for Coronavirus Disease 2019, when the disease was discovered. Like all other coronaviruses, it is sensitive to ultraviolet rays. So let's talk about how UV light can do that. Ultraviolet light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and the electromagnetic spectrum is the range of all frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. It is arranged by their respective wavelengths and those associated photon energies. If we look at the EM spectrum, you can see different bands whose names you might be familiar with. At the low energy end, the wavelengths are longer, and that is the radio wavelengths. The length of a wave down here, at the bottom, can be very long, hundreds of meters, all the way down to hundreds of thousands of kilometers or more. As we progress up the spectrum, the radio waves get shorter, and eventually we hit the band where the waves are called microwave. In the microwave band, they're just millimeters long, and they are much higher in energy. As the length of the waves gets shorter, the photon traveling along the wave is higher in energy. Next up is the infrared band. The length of a wave in this band can be as long as a millimeter or as short as 700 nanometers and a nanometer is tiny. A nanometer is just one billionth of a meter. Moving up in energy past that, the wavelengths get shorter still, and from 700 nanometers down to 400 nanometers, we have the band of the spectrum that we call visible light. You probably remember that the colors of visible light go from low energy to high energy, and they go in this order. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, or Roy G. Biv. At least that's how I learned it. You know the violet has more energy than any other light in the visible band because it has the smallest wavelength, and that's just 400 nanometers. Finally, we move higher yet into the ultraviolet range. In this range, wavelengths go from 400 nanometers 
all the way down to 100 nanometers. And we kind of break that band down into smaller parts. We call them UVA for the longer section, UVB for the middle section, and UVC for the shortest wavelength. The UVC band is the highest energy of the three since the wavelengths are the shortest. In fact, they are so high in energy that they are very destructive to life. If we go higher still on the spectrum, we will see X-rays, which we all know what those are. And of course, gamma rays are at the top in terms of the highest energy. The wavelengths here go down to 100 picometers, and a picometer is a trillionth of a meter. In fact, gamma rays have just the right amount of energy to turn a Bruce Banner into a Hulk. So these are valuable rays to have. Okay, so the ideal amount of energy to kill tiny germs with, as it turns out, is energy contained in the photons of the UVC band. There's a long history of it happening here on planet Earth. In fact, the sun actually sends out electromagnetic radiation in a wide range of the spectrum, from radio waves all the way through infrared, visible, and ultraviolet. Fortunately for us, the ozone layer in the Earth's atmosphere has the ability to block almost all of the harmful UV light from getting to us. It virtually completely blocks UVC and even blocks a good bit, of, good bit of the UVB. But that wasn't always the case. When our planet was created about four and a half billion years ago, there was no atmosphere. And the full blast of UV rays hit the Earth. It didn't much matter then because there was no life. Life also needed water. But over the next billion plus years, comets routinely struck the Earth and brought water with them. Then around 3.4 billion years ago, the first spark of life happened deep in the oceans. In fact, it was probably energy from ultraviolet rays that kicked off the first chemical reactions to give us life. Finally, microscopic life in the form of bacteria developed. A billion years passed, and along the way, cyanobacteria developed and started releasing oxygen into the ocean. And it rose out of the water. The oxygen production was a byproduct of their photosynthesis. But it took another 1.6 billion years to release enough oxygen in the atmosphere to get it up to about 21%. All the while, it was too dangerous for life in the seas to come to the surface because the UVC radiation coming from the sun would kill them. These bacteria lived in a delicate balance between staying shallow enough to have the light that they needed to live, yet deep enough that the water blocked the UVC portion of the light that would kill them. But during this whole time period, something interesting happened. The UV light coming from the sun would split the oxygen molecules in two. They would split them into a single oxygen atom, which would sometimes bond with another oxygen molecule, creating a new molecule that had three oxygen atoms. This was ozone. The ozone rose up high in the atmosphere and settled in the stratosphere, which is the second layer of Earth's atmosphere. By around 600 million years ago, there was finally enough ozone to block the UVC entering the Earth's atmosphere, and life could finally move out of the oceans where its evolution had been very slow. It was tough for organisms to live in that narrow band of being low enough in the water to prevent UVC from hitting them, but high enough to still get enough energy from sunlight to perform photosynthesis. It's all ironic in a way. The very same UV light that gave the energy required to kickstart life itself was actually killing it, forcing life to live in a narrow, limited, and harsh environment. But all that was about to end, now that the entire planet was protected from the dangerous bands of UVC. Life went crazy. The event was called the Cambrian Explosion. It began around 541 million years ago, and in an extremely short period of time on the geologic scale, virtually all known phyla of life appeared on the fossil record. It's kind of amazing, really. All we needed was UV light to kick it off, and then stop the UV light to make it go crazy. So it would seem we really do have a long history with UV light. But let's move forward in time. By the 1800s, we knew what UV light could do. There was a paper published in 1878 about the sterilization of bacteria using short wavelength light. And in 1903, Niels Finsen won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for showing that UV light killed the bacteria that causes lupus. We've even been using UV light to clean drinking water since it started in France in 1910. In the 1990s, we discovered that UV light was even more deadly than we thought on organisms like Giardia, and the U.S. began wide-ranging treatment of wastewater with UV light. So how does UV light kill a virus? Today, all scientists recognize the power of UV lights in the sanitation process. 
and it is a natural fit to use it in the disinfection of medical face masks. The N95 face masks, for example, are rather delicate pieces of equipment. They're far too sensitive to be cleaned by many methods. The masks have many layers, and the layers are made up of a material called melt-blown cloth. It's a non-woven material that has pores far smaller than any woven cloth, and although that helps with catching the virus particles and bacteria, it's not the main reason for the efficacy. The secret lies in the middle layer, which is an electrostatically charged material. The man who invented the material that was used in the N95 masks is Dr. Peter Sai. And there's an article about him in the U.S. Embassy in Georgia explaining how he led a research team to develop a material that filtered air by attracting particles through electrostatically charged fibers. In 1992, the team developed a material consisting of both positive and negative charges, attracting particles such as dust, bacteria, and viruses by trapping 95% of them by polarization before they can pass through the mask. The charge on it attracts tiny, low-mass particles and causes them to stick. Basically, this mask does a lot more than filter. It actually has the ability to pull tiny particles to it and absorb them to the surface, just like how you can electrostatically charge a balloon on your sweater and it will stick to a wall. Lots of potential cleaning methods would destroy the electrostatic layer in a mask and essentially render it useless to the medical community. So the cleaning method used would have to be one that has little to no effect on this layer. And as it turns out, of all the approved methods, the UVC light causes the least amount of disruption and changes to this layer. The next most popular method is high pressure steam hydrogen peroxide. But there are big drawbacks to this system. Masks have to be shipped to an outside facility and the turnaround time is fairly slow. Adding to the difficulty is the increased likelihood of a mask getting bent or damaged or deformed during transport. It's critical to avoid this because it would interfere with the proper fit and face seal, rendering the mask useless. A portable UVC sanitizer, on the other hand, requires no transporting of masks off-site, no long waiting times, no risk of face piece damage, and no high dollar costs. The user can simply take off their mask, pop it in for 10 minutes, and it's back in business. I've attached all the CDC-approved research studies that have concluded the exact amount of exposure needed and why in the description below if you want to dig deeper into their scientific methodology. But collectively, these data suggest that respirators could be decontaminated by ultraviolet germicidal irradiation for up to 20 cycles at a dose of one half to one joule per square centimeter per cycle. The N95 mask was never designed to be a reusable piece of equipment, and the CDC requires them to be used once and thrown away as a general rule. The exception, however, exists for emergency and pandemic usage where the alternative is to have no mask or use a contaminated mask. In those situations, the CDC allows emergency use of decontamination systems for the N95. As far as decontamination of other items, though, it's still a great choice for many things. So this is a very simplified representation of a SARS-CoV-2 particle. Uh, basically, there is a capsid that surrounds the nucleic or genetic material that's on the inside. There are proteins that are found on the surface of the membrane. These proteins are what bind with surface proteins receptors on our body cells that allow this particle to gain entry into our cells. And in the case of the, this particular SARS virus, the nucleic acid information happens to be a strand of RNA. And so this strand of RNA, like all nucleic acids, consists of four nucleotide bases. Um, instead of A, G, C, and T, it contains A, G, C, and U. U is the uracil. Uracil replaces the T in thymine. Um, but essentially, the ultraviolet light will go to uh, make dimers out of some of these, lock these things together in a permanent covalent bond, and render this whole thing ineffective. So this is a 3D molecular model of a strand of DNA. This is 12 nucleotide bases long, and maybe we can use this to kind of illustrate what happens when uh, DNA or any nucleic acid comes into contact with ultraviolet light. So if I take a shorter segment of the model, uh, a six-stranded segment, it's a little bit easier to explain and understand. Uh, if I were to unwind the, the DNA molecule, then we could also go and separate it. Basically, we have uh, the nucleotide bases are attached together and they form this double helix. 
And if we just had a single strand of it, this would be a single stranded DNA, which is found in many different virus particles. Or we could have a single stranded RNA, for example. Uh, the difference being, in, uh, of course, the nucleotide base that is thymine, if we take a methyl group from it, it becomes a uracil. And so the coronavirus is actually a single-stranded RNA virus. So the single-stranded RNA virus would essentially undergo a change. When uh, ultraviolet light hits this, we would have two thymines that would permanently covalently bond together like this. That would destroy this molecule's ability to replicate itself. Okay, so I thought I would try to show you uh, what exactly happens on this printed model. Of, of DNA as opposed to what happens on that 3D molecular model. It's a little bit easier. Uh, the molecular model doesn't always bend the way that we want it to. But when we have uh, photons coming in, ultraviolet photons, what they do is they essentially will break the covalent bonds. If the molecule we're starting out with is a DNA molecule, they'll break these covalent bonds, they'll spread apart the two halves of the DNA chain, and they'll form a covalent bond these are all hydrogen bonds, so they're weak, but they'll form a, it'll form a covalent bond between two thymine molecules. This is basically called a thymine dimer, and this is a permanent covalent bond. This is a non-reversible bond, and this goes to destroy the DNA, essentially because whether we're dealing with DNA or RNA, as in the case of the coronavirus, uh, this permanent bond here will prevent the RNA from functioning the way it's supposed to function and renders it useless so it doesn't have the ability to reprogram our own cells machinery uh, to do its destructive bidding. Now we're going to test it inside of the box. I've got the meter pointed up and we're going to turn it on and see what this goes to. So we've got 4200 microwatts. Now we're going to use milliwatts for most of our calculations so that would be 4.2 milliwatts per square centimeter of light. And then what I did is I proceeded to move around the box all over the place and checked the various readings in different locations. I wanted to find the location in the box that had the lowest possible reading and that was over in the corner and you see that comes in at about 2200 microwatts which is 2.2 milliwatts per square centimeter. And so we've checked it everywhere and it looks like right at around 2000 you can see that, that light pops on when it comes on. Right around 2000 is our, our lowest rating everywhere in the box. So we'll base our calculations on that. And this is basically how the box will work. I've put a chain on it here with some screws into the side to hold it partially open for us. And you can see the grid on the inside, how it fits. The corner cuts had to go in to make space for the limit switch and for the wires that go from the top to the bottom. And then loading it and using it is actually pretty simple. We just set the masks on the surface here. It doesn't really matter which way you put them. Uh, this way down or the other way down is all fine because this box is equally illuminated from all sides. Close the lid, uh, make sure the power's on, and turn the timer on, and that starts it. Set your time. Uh, I've set it for five minutes there, but in reality, you've got to set it for 10 minutes. That's the math on this to guarantee that the virus is completely neutralized it is 10 minutes. You verify uh, through those two portals that the light is on. And when the light goes off, it's done. And then you take the masks out, and they're clean and ready to go. The one final thing you have to do, according to the CDC, is check the physical integrity of the mask and the strap. After a number of cycles, they'll break down, probably somewhere between 20 and 30 cycles. Once they break down, they're no longer considered safe. So I'm going to take a minute to go over the calculations. We found wherever I put the meter in the box, the point that got the lowest amount of light got 2,000 microwatts per square centimeter of light. That is equivalent to 2 milliwatts per square centimeter of UVC output. And 2 milliwatts per square centimeter of output times 500 seconds equals 1,000 millijoules per square centimeter of energy. And that's equivalent to 1 joule per square centimeter of energy, which is exactly twice what the CDC says is required to fully penetrate the masks and kill the virus. Finally, if we take that 500 seconds worth of time, divide that by 60 seconds in a minute, we'll get 8.33 minutes that you need to set the timer for. So if you round that up to 10 minutes, you're guaranteed to totally sanitize the surface and have a mask that's ready to go. And incidentally, this will clean anything. It doesn't have to be a mask. Anything you put in the box will be sanitized. 
You think he's gonna bite me? No. 